Hello, I'm Lorelei Corcoran, Professor and Director of the Institute of Egyptian Art and Archaeology at the University of Memphis. Welcome to the 17th Annual Legacy of Egypt Spring Lecture Series. This series celebrates the cultural contributions and continuity of ancient Egypt in the past and up to the present day. It's my pleasure to introduce our speaker, Tom Hardwick, Consulting Curator of Egyptology at the Houston Museum of Natural Science in Houston, Texas. Tom Hardwick received his BA in Egyptology and Classics from the Queens College at the University of Oxford and continued graduate studies in the art of the New Kingdom and the Royal Sculpture of the Second Intermediate Period and Early 18th Dynasty at the Faculty of Oriental Studies at the University of Oxford. He was a curatorial assistant at the Ashmolean Museum in Oxford and keeper of Egyptology at the Bolton Museum in England before becoming a consulting curator at the Grand Egyptian Museum in Cairo, teaching at the American University in Cairo and serving as cultural officer for UNESCO in South Sudan. His interest and expertise in museology and the art of collecting is evident from his numerous articles in Egyptological journals and monographs, such as Who Was Who in Egyptology, as well as his contributions to such art-oriented publications as Time Out London, The Art Newspaper, and The Burlington Magazine. His talk, Something Old, Something New, Uses and Abuses of Ancient Egyptian Statues, will focus on the ways in which pharaonic statues have been made and changed from the New Kingdom to the 21st century, and offers a discussion of the methods and motives behind these changes. Please enjoy this presentation by Tom Hardwick. Thank you for your introduction, Lorelei. Um, I obviously haven't heard you speaking it, but you sent me a copy so I could check what you were going to say, and I, there's, there's nothing libelous. Um, this is the first Zoom lecture I have recorded, so I've uh, experienced for the first time the pleasure of arranging your bookshelf in a, in a meaningful way to show off your, uh, your erudition. Um, and let me now get down to this. Share. And to my talk, and I will now disappear from the corner of the screen so you can concentrate on the images. I'm sorry not to be in your Memphis, Lorelei, but it's uh, good that uh, this is being recorded for a, perhaps a more permanent audience. I'm speaking to you from Cairo, which is only a few miles away from the older, perhaps better known outside Tennessee, Memphis, the capital of Pharaonic Egypt for many times during its 3000 year history, but looking rather sad. What has happened to the glorious temples we know it had? Where have they gone? This is uh, what remains. And here in one of my favorite mosques in Cairo, the Mameluk Mosque of Amir al-Maridani from 1340 uh, AD, you can see, I hope my um, cursor is visible, you can see here evidently a classical column with a Corinthian capital and, uh, and pedestal. And then here in the mosque, one, two, three, and in fact, several more solid, granite columns carved from the granite from Aswan with these curious uh, concentric semicircles at the top. These are, these show that the column was once like this, a column in the shape of a date palm with uh, bound, bound leaves tied together. So this is one answer to what happened to ancient Memphis. It became, uh, it became Islamic Cairo. Uh, and pharaonic Egyptian objects have been recycled and reused almost since the moment they were made. And while we 
always go on about the permanence, the solidity of Egyptian objects. That's uh, what uh, aestheticians always talk about, the, um, the, the way they seem to defy time. Um, for the Egyptians themselves, the Phronic Egyptians themselves, they may have thought rather differently. Uh, Pointers, the Edward Pointers, 1867 painting Israel in Egypt, uh, showing indentures enslaved Hebrews hauling uh, sculpture around, uh, features two objects that had recently come to the West. The uh, Soleb lion brought by Lord Prudder, who would become the Duke of Northumberland and presented the British Museum in the 1830s, and then something inspired by one of the um, moth, the uh, obelisks at the Temple of Luxor, which had been taken by a French expedition and erected in the Place de la Concorde in, in the 1830s. Um, these were things which were recorded with pride by European expeditions for the effort they took. Um, <clears throat> and in 10 years after Pointer painted this, uh, London would get an obelisk of its own and Cleopatra's needle. So we're accustomed to see objects in sites and in museums and treat them with respect by virtue of their size, their age and their beauty. But for the Pharaonic Egyptians, and also still today for people who don't approach ancient Egyptian objects from an Egyptological point of view, these concerns counted for little. We can see a more pragmatic relationship with pharaonic objects, one which, which may well treat objects as uh, worthy of respect and veneration, but which is also acutely aware of their physical and practical value, aware of the material quarried and moved, the value of the time, gained or lost, and now moving to the more recent past, the financial value of objects on the art market. The idea of use and reuse of, sculpt of uh, sculptures is an area that in the last generation, a lot of scholars have been studying in great detail in alphabetical order and doubtless ignoring, doubtless forgetting people, Simon Connor, Betsy Bryan, uh, Barbara Gilly, Ray Johnson, Ariel Kozlov and Hurig Saruzian have all talked about how sculptures are used and reused. And this is what I'm going to talk about today, how statues have been used, reused and abused over nearly 4,000 years. I'll give some examples, trot through them, and I hope show how you can spot the processes involved. I'll start, however, with the conclusion. Look at things, ask questions, and draw your own conclusions when you're confronted with Egyptian objects or indeed anything in a museum. Draw your own conclusions before you read the label. And if your conclusions are at odds with the label, keep thinking, it might well be that you are wrong or it might well be that you are right. Many of the pieces I'll be talking about have been operating under different aliases until recently when, when their history has been uh, yet further uh, elucidated. So let's start with quarrying, uh, getting the statues out of the stone. This early 20th century stereogram of the uh, 92 foot obelisk still lying in the Aswan granite quarry um, is a, an old image of a site of a site that's familiar, I'm sure, to many people. The unfinished obelisk in 1906, whenever this was, 1904, it was 92 feet long. When it was cleared in the in the middle, a few a generation later, it turned out to be 138 feet, 42 meters long. Uh, it's a uh, quarried in the New Kingdom, probably the reign of Hatshepsut, and destined for the great temple of Amun-Ra at Karnak. Um, when you look at it this way, you can see that at some point in the quarrying, cracks appeared in the stone and uh, no point digging it out any further when the stone was obviously flawed, so the obelisk was abandoned. It represented, I don't even want to begin to guess how many thousands of man hours in choosing the site and quarrying it out. 
all invested so far to, to no avail. And so there is no surprise when you come to the other, the top end of the uh, obelisk, you can see here, someone has put in some longitudinal trenches as a means of trying to um, break off a still large chunk of granite to, uh, to use, because if someone has already quarried half of it out, it makes sense to, uh, to try and do the rest yourself. Uh, this was put, paid to, however, by, you can see this final crack, which, encour which encouraged people to give up on the whole thing. Once out of the quarry, however, objects uh, could get damaged even before they were installed. The so-called Colossi of Memnon from the mortuary temple of Amenhotep III of the 18th dynasty on the West Bank at Thebes, an old photograph of the two statues that were outside the first pylon back when the Nile inundation still happened. The site of the mortuary temple had been a scene had been ruined around uh, in, the, in the 19th dynasty, it seems, by an earthquake. It was a site that was quarried by, um, by later pharaohs looking for building material. And uh, in the 19th century, it was farmland with occasional exciting looking bits of stone poking out. In the, uh, it was surveyed in the 20th century. And in the last 20 years, a team led by Hurig Saruzian has been clearing the site and finding astonishing quantities of sculpture. The two colossal statues at the first pylon were the first of three sets of three pairs of statues um, in the courtyards leading to the, the heart of the mortuary temple, which have now been uh, brought to light and in some cases re-erected. <clears throat> this piece is a large alabaster or calcite travertine, whatever you wish to call it, a uh, seated colossal figure of Amenhotep III behind, found behind the Colossi of Memnon. And you can see up here that alabaster is a stone with veins of varying, quali veins of varying quality, uh, rectangular pieces here, which were obviously where better pieces of stone were inlaid. And particularly exciting is this round, Thing on his cheek, it looks like a beauty spot. And uh, the publication, first of all, you see how big it is. You can see that there is a socket that screws into place to fix a new plate of alabaster now missing on the king's cheek to make him look, uh, to make him look as, to uh, get rid of a bad piece of stone and make the statue look, look better. So if what you can see here are repairs made during installation, later generations of Egyptians looked after images that had fallen into disrepair or more frequent been deliberately damaged. In the Cairo Museum is a dyad a pair statue of Tutmos III, the 18th dynasty on the right, and a moon, chief god of, of Thebes, on the left. You know it's a moon because of his tall, two-plumed crown, which comes out of a sort of uh, flaring skullcap. When you look at this, however, you can see there's something up with a moon's face. It's made of, see more easily on the uh, side view, it's made of a different piece of stone. <clears throat> this is not, um, Due, this was not something that happened in manufacturing, but uh, a few generations after Tutmos III's death, uh, his successor, but several, Amenhotep IV, Akhenaten, uh, takes against the cult, of, the cult of the moon and destroys images and the name of the god all over his temple. So the temples were vandalized, the face, these images of the gods were damaged. And then Akhenaten's successor, who goes back to the cult of the moon, Tutank Tutankhamun, uh, has to undertake the colossal task of making repairs to all of these damaged statues. If you look closer, and then the same figure also from Karnak um, shows carved in alabaster, shows a moon in the center with 
Tutmos the first, you can just see his name in the beautiful 18th dynasty paleography here, and uh, Queen Ahmose Nefertari, Tutmos the first grandmother. There's no difference between the head of a moon and the head of the other people, so a moon's head hasn't been replaced. But as an art historian, someone who's interested in artistic style, you can see that these are not faces of, Tutmos, of uh, the Tutmosid period. They have, however, these sort of slightly sunken, lidded eyes of Tutankhamun. So how much of this is, is a Tutankhamun repair? If you look here, it doesn't look so bad, but you can then see that the veins in the alabaster run horizontally on the bottom and vertically on the top. And a side view shows more clearly um, this seam here. So Artem's, the, uh, the, the agents of Akhenaten damaged the top part of this group so badly that it was easier just to level it off and, uh, and replace it. If you look even further, you can see that uh, the body of a moon himself, has his, his lower legs have been replaced. So this is a sophisticated piece of repair, which however, if you go to the bottom line, took less time to do and also commemorated your ancestors. So it was a, a better choice to make than making something from, uh, from scratch. Uh, there's a paradox that Tutankhamun, um, who, whose name is a household, is a household word today, um, was very little known before the discovery of his tomb. And yet, because he did, uh, he was the first king to start restoring the damaged statues of a moon, his face is on dozens, if not even hundreds, of figures of the god Amun. Um, but, People were less aware of this because, as you can see on this statue from his mortuary temple at uh, Luxor, now in the Oriental Institute in Chicago, if you look on the back pillar where his name is written in cartouches, the surface where his name is, is much rougher than the smooth surface where the rest of the inscription is. And it's not Tutankhamun's name, it's his face, but not his name. Inside is the name of Horemheb, his successor but one, who who takes over many of Tutankhamun's uh, monuments. And this is one way to look at statues that have been reused, or term Egyptologists often use, usurped. Uh, when you're doing something to a stone statue, you're always on the bottom, bottom line, you're taking material away. You can't make something bigger. You have, you're always cutting material down and making the most of what you've got left. And this doesn't just happen with names. So when you see a name, you'd always think is this original, it happens with faces. This, the cartouches on this statue tell you it is Ramesses II of the 19th century, Ramesses, 19th dynasty, Ramesses the Great, warrior, builder, etc. well-known name. Um, but when you look at it, uh, he's got rather a sort of, ripped, hunky body, not quite as you would imagine for Ramesses, and a suspiciously small head on a rather long neck, which is a sign that a statue that you can't, uh, that, that you've changed the feet, you've changed a face, and because of that the face has shrunk, and so that it looks too small for the body and too, uh, too small for the neck. When you uh, see this photo of it, uh, the statue lying on its side, you can then see, uh, first of all, something rather odd with the ears. The earlobes just sort of go on and on, the sign that the ears haven't changed, but the face has shrunk. And so they've had the earlobes have sort of stretched to, to fill the gap. But then on the top of the head, where the Nemes headdress is, if you look at the back, you see this very fine sort of syncopated pattern of, uh, of pleats in the quartzite. Um, and then on the back, and then the same pattern on the top, and then on the this line on the crown of the head, also visible on the front, the pattern changes. So on the back, you have the old pattern, and on the front, the new pattern they put on 
not bothering to line it up with the old one uh, when Ramesses' face was transformed. Uh, the royal woman standing by his, uh, his foot originally looked like this piece on, on the right and got given a fashionable 19th dynasty pleated robe. Uh, Ramesses got given a two belly buttons, uh, well rather a second belly button, and then his name, the name of the original owner of this, on the belt on the belt of the kilt was erased, um, and Ramses's name was put on on the seat. Uh, two scholars, Simon Connor and uh, Daniel Solomon, have published articles arguing whether it's uh, Amenhotep the Fourth, as shown here, or Senbosrit the Third. Um, you pay your money and you take your choice. But the point is that Ramesses, this great builder, is doing it on the cheap. Or is he? At any rate, he is uh, usurping and recycling sculpture. And here is a drawing prepared by Simon Connor showing on the right the areas in grey that were changed to turn a 12th dynasty face into a 19th dynasty face and Nemes. So in addition to the, uh, the headdress, he got uh, a collar, um, holes for his ears and a different treatment of the eyes. And again, you see the Uraeus serpent standing, standing in high relief on the Nemes. This is a sign of the original ancient surf, the oldest surface. And then further back is the recut surface. And then finally, I, a friend sent me this photograph recently, a statue in the uh, Egyptian Museum in Cairo, very difficult to photograph. Uh, long been recognized again as Ramesses II on a 12th dynasty king. And you can see here um, beautiful lighting, really, and smart, a smart piece of photography really brings out. They didn't here, they didn't even bother to change the pleating on the front of the Nemes all the way around, like the previous one. So he's got this sort of halo of fuzzy worked stone, recently worked stone on the front and around his ears. So when you're looking to see if something is original or not, look at different surface textures. Um, once a piece of stone has been polished and exposed to the air, it's much harder to, to gain exactly the same polish. So any reworking will leave not just a difference in level, but also a difference in texture. So if this has given you an idea of the issues behind how king statues are reworked, many people have worked on this. How can we, does this happen in statues for non-kings, private people and royal women? And once you start looking for discrepancies in style, date, and, te and different textures of stone, uh, more examples keep popping out at you. And what I'm going to talk about is something Simon Connor and I have been working on for a few years. So I'll give you some, a few examples, all from the 19th dynasty, the time of Ramesses the Great, for representative and interesting examples. First of all, a block statue of a man inscribed down the front. He's a standard bearer, a, a fan bearer, sorry. So he has an important role next to the king and he's called Minmos. And we know which king it is because the cartouche of Ramesses II is carved on the front of the block statue. This so-called block statue, a crouching figure wrapped around in a cloak to make this sort of slightly mummy-like indeterminate form, very popular for temple sculpture. The idea is that you, the person represented, are sitting patiently waiting in the temple to, uh, to, gain, the, to gain an audience with the god and gain offerings from passers-by. And also this wrapped surface gives you um, room to put inscriptions. Um, so you see the cartouche oops, of Ramesses II, so is it 19th dynasty? When you compare Minmos's face with that of Ramesses, private people generally look like the king as a way of sucking up to royalty. Minmos does not look like Ramesses in particular. However, he looks a lot like this man, Senefa, mayor of Thebes in the reign of Amenhotep II and Tutmose IV in the 18th dynasty, so a hundred odd years before Ramesses. So was Minmos 
did he just like to look old fashioned? What I think is far more clear is that Minmo's took an old took a statue and uh, put his own name on it. And in support of this, if you look at the uh, if you look down on him, you can see there's not much space between his feet and the front of the the of the plinth. To me, it seems clear. Normally, you have a bit more wiggle room that the front of the plinth was inscribed by owner number one, and Minmo's just had it uh, polished, sliced off, and inscribed it for himself on uh, on the body. So in Minmo's, you've got a case of a an old statue just getting a new name, nothing else. Now we go to, uh, also in the Cairo Museum, uh, this granodiorite statue of a man called Mai, who cartouches uh, on his shoulder, established worked in the reign of Meremptah, the successor of Ramses II, and uh, has a number of titles, including the overseer of, uh, of works. So he's someone who's involved in um, building projects for Meremptah. He's an important person and there are plenty of inscriptions known for him. We know he's a 19th dynasty guy. And yet, and yet the statue doesn't look 19th dynasty in its form with, here you can compare it with a more typical 19th dynasty guy, Neb Wenenef in Detroit. Um, the wig is different. The face looks kind of different, and the costume is different. They loved these gaudy, pleated linen, linen garments in the 19th dynasty, and Mai is bare-chested with a sort of high-waisted kilt, which finds its parallels in the Middle Kingdom, the, the 12th dynasty, so 500-odd um, uh, years earlier. And also Mai's pose with his palms turned up Beseeching, beseeching in divine intercession is something that is extremely rare. I can't think of any in the New Kingdom, but fairly common enough in the Middle Kingdom. So what's going on? Is this, is my just being very old fashioned? Is he archaizing or is something else happening? Um, and again, you can see uh, the wig is typical of the, um, of the 12th dynasty. When you use your trusty Nokia uh, phone feeble LED to give you a raking light on the statue, however, you can see these differences in texture I was talking about. And here, there's a smooth surface here and a rougher surface here. And then on his chin, he's sort of got stubble. He's got a rough surface here and under his rather weird looking stubby beards. And again, in fact, the texture of the carving of the line at his throat is not the same as that of the hair on his wig. So uh, you can also see something going on around his eyes. Uh, what I think is clear is that he's been recarved. You can see this, again, this funny little beard um, uh, on the chin and also uh, you can just see a ghost of a longer wing, a wig tip, a really long decadent one on his chest. So in our opinion, this is a Middle Kingdom statue that has been recarved by Mai um, as overseer of works and placed in the Temple of Ptah, King of, uh, God of Craftsmen in Memphis. Uh, if you sort of color code, these different surfaces, you can see where um, Mai in red got this, this sort of rough older surface. And then comparing the face now with these other parallels, what seems to have happened is that his face to become a round ramicide face, he, his chin got um, severely truncated. Um, and indeed, comparing it with other Middle Kingdom figures, his eyes got raised up to give him this sort of small roundish face instead of a longer squarish face typical of the Middle Kingdom. And again in profile, um, and for some reason I think the, the tips of the wig were also recarved. 
perhaps this is an old statue where they were damaged and he leveled them off, or he thought that this was a step too far. And again, you can see Mai's squishy little nose because the sculptor had nothing else to make it out of. And again, you can really see how his funny little beard is built on the remains of his chin. So for Mai, the statue has been updated to give a ramicide face while keeping its Middle Kingdom attributes and general aroma of being very old intact. The next, uh, and there he is once more. The next statue, again in the Cairo Museum, is of the vizier, the chief official in the land, Passer. He's a man for many statues and, and, and other monuments are known, found in the Keshet in the Temple of Karnak. Uh, it was originally, he's shown a block statue. Unlike Minmo's, he's got feet rather than an undifferentiated body. And he's holding in front of him the um, triad of the, the divine symbols of some of the gods of Egypt, which appear to have been hollowed out and then I think added in something like plaster or another material to make them stand out, which is a little unusual. And then at the uh, other views, you can see at the back the knot that, of the robe that the vizier we wears oops, was again added in. Um, uh, added on rather than carved in. And then you can see another sign, his toes are really at the edge of the plinth like we saw with Minmo's. So what's going on? And it's even more shocking when you look at his face, he's got an ear larger than, his, larger than it should be stuck right on top of his, his head, way higher than it should be. And when you see the other ear, um, you can also see this line here within which his face has sort of shrunk and this smooth, well-polished piece of stone here and here. So again, we think this is the, um, the original surface of a statue that has been drastically recut. Um, showing the original surface. Um, and then again, looking, you can see a shadow here where the original feet once were. And so this is to what, what I think has, hap has happened is that Passer was confronted with a statue that looked rather like a block statue from an earlier period, probably the 18th dynasty, that looked like Minmoses. And rather than just putting his name on it, he has it drastically remodeled. So this gives you an idea of options available if you want to reuse uh, an earlier statue. The piece I'll now mention is one Simon Connor and I worked on and then discovered that Barbara, Barbara Gilly had got to it before us, um, published an excellent article about this and other pieces in the Festschrift for, um, who is it, for Edgar Push. Um, we don't disagree on, we don't agree on all of it, but um, her work, uh, it's nice to know that we were both on the same track. This is a statue of the inscription names her as the mother of Ramesses II, uh, Queen Tuya, her name is preserved. Um, it comes from the Delta site of Tanis. It's long been realized that this is, something odd is going on. You can see she's sitting on a, um, on a cushion, um, but, uh, the, decor the inscription here uses epithets common to the Middle Kingdom. Um, however, the pleated robe and the wig are New Kingdom things. So the question has always been, is this a statue that's made to look inspired by Middle Kingdom uh, prototypes, or is it a statue that's been reworked? And Barbara and Simon and I can answer this definitively. Uh, it's been altered. There's had a hole drilled in the head for a modius and plumes like this other statue of a royal woman from Ramesses II's uh, uh, household. And the fact that it was put on 
to me indicates that uh, this is an older statue that's being adapted. When you, um, there's also something strange going on with the line of the thumbs here. So this again is an indication that the statue was, uh, was, re was reworked. Uh, it's when you look at the face, however, that it becomes most clear. You can see this semicircular area where an ear once was that on the normal type of wig would have been hidden behind hair. And when you look in the middle, you can see these little preserved pieces of original surface for the inside of the ear, uh, shown better here. And then when you look at the face, you see above her eyes, you can see this area filled with round holes. And this is the key to the decoding the piece. Um, these are drill holes for inlaid eyes. And the closest examples come from statues of royal women of the Middle Kingdom, also found at Tanis. So you can see that this is one of the, the same or a similar series that was reworked for Ramesses' wife. Uh, here they are again. Um, and then trying to, Simon and I have tried to work out just how much was missing. If you fix the ear and the eyes and fix the ear and the eyes there, you can really see how drastically um, this royal woman was reworked to become Ramesses' mum. We played around working out which sort of wig it was. We don't think it was this big Hathoric wig, instead this plainer wig. Um, you can see on the, the back, this sort of funny stepping of the wig. Again, you can't put stone where it's already been taken away. Um, and comparing it with other royal Middle Kingdom women, you can see how this lines up with, uh, uh, with the wig. And when you look at it in profile, you can see how, uh, again, just how much is missing and how uh, in order to keep her attached to the throne, Tuya ended up sitting on this little, um, who had a skinnier body form than the plump Middle Kingdom women, ended up sitting on this little cushion. And Tuya is probably better known to many people from this beautiful statue in the Vatican Museum in Rome. Um, you can see, it's, terrible, it's a terrible statue to take good photographs of, um, the back pillar with her name and her son's titles is rather rough compared to the beautiful polished surface of her body. That's, you know, a sign that something is, is, is suspicious. And then when you look at her face, you can see the beautiful polish of her wig and then here the wonderful detail of the curls of the wig um, set against the rough, surf, the rough treatment of the Uraeus, the Uraeus serpents inscribed with the cartouche of Ramesses, this much rougher appearance of her necklace and also of her bracelet. There are two different ways of treating stone here. And then also you can see how her face has sort of shrunk within her wig, another sign of a recarved face. And here are two uh, figures of Amenhotep III's Queen, Queen T which um, Ariel Kozlov, who published Tuya um, first as a reworked statue, uh, showed very clearly that she's been, uh, Ramesses gave his mother a statue of an older queen. And then once again, when you look in profile, you can see that uh, the slim Tuya was obviously very proud of her elegant figure and they slimmed down her, her thighs. So she's got this shadow of Queen T's larger body underneath, and then a figure of uh, the royal daughter, Henot Mire. So here are five examples of sculptures all reworked in the reign of Ramesses the Great. It may seem strange that when, you know, we always talk about Ramses the Great, a great builder, um, a great fighter, what's going on with these pieces that weren't originally made for the people whose names they now bear? 
people I think would say that this shows, you know, Ramesses was overextending himself and he, um, he cut corners. I think that may be true, but the people who are cutting corners are extremely important people. We've got a, a man who is a fan bearer around the person of the king. We've got the man who builds his own, his own monuments. Uh, we've got the vizier, the highest non-royal in the land. And we've got the king's mother. These are all people who by rights should be able to commission statues of their own. And so uh, some people might say, well, it just shows that they didn't notice. And I turn it round and say that if it's taken Egyptology a hundred years to get to the point where we can spot things like this, the ancient Egyptians who didn't have to learn this, who grew up with this, would have known it all along and that they didn't care, or rather not that they didn't care, but that they were in some, you know, they were aware of it. And it, it was something that, um, that they were happy to do. You weren't just, cutting corners and saving money on stone, you were allying yourself with the people whose statues had gone before. So if this is how statues were used and abused in the, uh, in the 19th dynasty, let's move onwards to the 19th and 20th centuries. Uh, people have been interested in Egyptian objects since in fact uh, the, the Roman Empire, Rome is full of statues brought over by the emperors to adorn temples of Isis and uh, pleasure gardens. And sadly, they haven't lasted uh, 2000 years so well. Statues are damaged and need repair. One such again in, in Rome is this statue of a man called Ujahor Reznet, who was uh, a high official under the Persian kings. And in fact, he's wearing Persian lion-headed bracelets. Uh, this contains biographical texts. Someone called it the autobiography of a collaborator. Um, and sadly, he is missing his head. Maybe he was decapitated by people furious at his being a collaborator. If you were in Rome in the 18th century, however, he had a head and one with very fetching corkscrew curls. Um, no one now would say this was Egyptian, but in the 18th century, the fashion was to enjoy intact works of art rather than appreciating fragments. And so for I think the papal collections, someone gave Uja Horesnet a new head and I think thought he was a woman and so gave him uh, corkscrew locks and the German art historian Winkelmann accepted this as such. By the, uh, when was this? Um, by the early 20th century, however, fashions had changed and uh, people were aware that his, his uh, corkscrew locks were not authentic. And so he was given a remodeled head, uh, shown appropriately bald, serene, and much more Egyptian looking. Uh, by the uh, middle of the, by the, after World War II, however, tastes had changed even further, and any thought of restoration was deemed to be inadmissible. So Uja Horesnet got stripped down to his quintessential ancient self. The only exception, which I think is rather nice, is on the back of, on the back pillar, where when his head was missing, parts of the back pillar with inscriptions were also went missing, and the 18th, 17th, 18th century restoration restored those with, however, since no one could read hieroglyphs, uh, nonsense hieroglyphs, but some, uh, someone with a mania for, uh, for precision decided to keep this. So this is one remaining souvenir of Uja Horesnet's 300 years of uh, different restorations. Similarly, uh, Tuya, whom we saw being renovated in the 19th dynasty, she, she too was brought to Rome by the Roman emperors and rediscovered in the Renaissance, at which point she had lost her, her legs and her base. When you look at the back pillar, you can see that it's missing its inscription. It's a, it's a restoration in similar stone. And then 
Other things, when you look closely, show that she was restored probably in the 18th century at a time when people had a, had a yen for complete figures. Uh, you can see, if you look closely, that her whole lower face has been recarved, new nose, new chin. Uh, the handle of her scepter has also been recarved. And then, best of all, uh, on the side, so where the inscription stops, um, the princess Henut Mire continues uh, by someone who knew what Egyptian people, how Egyptian figures should look in reliefs. There were plenty of examples in uh, on obelisks and so on, and carried on. But uh, he turned her, the sculptor, possibly Cavacepi, who did a lot of the, this, turned her into a man with a kilt and slightly wonky looking uh, marching legs. I don't think there's any deception intended in these. You can see how the stone is, you know, is obviously different. But this is comes from a time where people appreciated complete works of art rather than alluring fragments. And the people we, the person we have to thank for or blame for this shift from restore to leave as is, is the Italian sculptor Canova who in London in the 18 teens was invited to restore, as was the fashion, the Elgin marbles, newly taken from Athens. And Canova said, no, 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 you, this, would be, this would be vandalism. They are better as they are. And then, start, and then started the pendulum swinging in the other direction towards the integrity of the fragments. So if there's no deception in any, of these in any of these examples, people just wanted something nice to look at, this changes as we get into the 19th and 20th centuries, where people are willing to pay ever-growing sums of money for ancient Egyptian objects. Sometimes, however, there are objects which no one wants to pay for, and this is a late period head that attracted the interest of Bernard von Bo Bernard Boatmer, the American art historian in the 1950s in, I think, a dealer's shop in Egypt. Uh, Boatma collected images of late period sculpture, and so he photographed it, although, as you can see, the face has been really bashed away. Ten years later, however, a dealer offered him this, which looks a lot nicer. He looks this rather uh, spry looking, uh, old gentleman with a bald head. Um, when you compare it in profile, however, you can see the, the hieroglyphs on the back pillar are the same. And you can, when you compare the photographs, as Boatmer, who had an excellent memory for this, uh, soon did, you can see that this ancient statue, this ancient head has been reworked to make it more appealing and more saleable. The dealer who offered it around with its new face uh, I think uh, sold it at a bargain price to Brooklyn Museum as a study object and Boatmer wrote this classic article called The Head That Grew a Face on the transformation, the modern transformation of this ancient sculpture. Uh, I talked about Akhenaten uh, vandalizing temples. He got his comeuppance after his death when his temples at his capital city Akhetaten were, were demolished and reused by Ramesses II in his temple at Hermopolis. Fragments, excavate, fragments of these blocks excavated in the 1930s were appeared on the art market through till the 70s. And this fragment photograph was seen showing, as the restoration shows, royal women with a dwarf. Sadly, the way the block was cut, uh, cut off the dwarf's head. And as we've seen, heads are valuable. So imagine my surprise at a dealer's where I saw this. It looked very nice and yet somehow familiar. And so when I checked through, I realized what had happened. Um, if you compare, I thought, is this, you know, another, the same scene in a better preserved block? No, it's not. Um, it's the same block that has then had the right hand corner cut off, turned round and flipped to make the head and the body of the dwarf. Um, and then the piece has been painted to make it look 
uh, to make it look consistent. It's a very clever piece of work, this, because the stone is, you know, is the same. There's conceivably, if you were confronted by, if you had a clever lawyer, you could argue that it's the same piece. It's just been slightly rearranged. But this is clearly a case where something has been altered for financial gain. And then I will close, since that's a rather depressing thought, with a new piece of alteration. Um, this is a pear statue in the British Museum as photographed in 1914. It's one of, it's a well-known piece by its style. It dates to the reign of Tutankhamun, the post-Amana period, um, and shows a man and his wife seated together with this rather unusual gesture of them holding hands. Uh, one thing that did happen in the 19th century, they got given new noses. If you look closely, you can see that these are plaster noses which have not been removed. Um, but the statue is uninscribed. So who, who was this, who was this couple? In the 1970s, an Anglo-Dutch team excavating in the tomb of Horemheb, who before he succeeds Tutankhamun is his general and builds and has constructs a wonderful tomb for himself. They were excavating in the Memphite tomb of Horemheb, found this curious lump showing hands clasped together in a ball. And uh, after a, a little thought, uh, René van Walsum said, ah, I know where I've seen a statue with, that looks at, came from Saqqara with clasped hands like this. And uh, they took, uh, they made a cast of the fragment and uh, took it to the British Museum and stuck it on. So uh, you can now see not only are the husband and wife holding hands after again after 3000 years, but because the fragment was found in the tomb of Horemheb, we can add another depiction of him to our list of images. So it's uh, a case where restoration of some where where restoration has has not just been for aesthetic benefits it's been for historical and academic benefits so i'll close this by once again thank thank you so much for the opportunity to talk lorelei and to anyone still listening i would encourage you when you when you're next in a museum we'll all be in museum soon to look very closely at, at Egyptian statues, look for things that aren't quite right, thing, things that are rough where they should be smooth, and see where following these thought, this, this line of thought uh, takes you. There's a lot of uh, reworking and restoration out there. You just have to look for it. Thank you.